and uh, as an East West Center grantee, a University of Hawaii student and faculty member. And so I'm uh, delighted to be back home. And uh, one of the great things about coming back to Hawaii, uh, from Hong Kong in my case, which I thought was the busiest place in the world, it turns out that my, my vision of a laid back Hawaii with not much going on except beach work and, and so forth is totally incorrect. Um, that we have, uh, since I've returned, the East West Center, along with other collaborating institutions, have run almost daily kinds of activities, one sort or another. And uh, part of our goal has been, at the East West Center at least, is to reach out even more vigorously and frequently to the members of the community across sectors, uh, in business, media, uh, government, military, uh, education, think tank, what have you, uh, and bring people together uh, to talk about important things, important things not only to the state, but to the Indo-Asia Pacific region, which we cover as the East-West Center, as does PACOM, as, uh, 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 same sort of thing from a somewhat different angle than we do. And uh, it's, today's event is just an example of that. Um, we have four institutions gathered together to hopefully bring you I'm confident to bring you a very interesting discussion this afternoon. Uh, East West Center, of course, here at, the, at Eman Center, Jefferson Hall, an IMP design building, uh, uh, internationally known for its uh, grace and concept of floating mass, uh, way back when it was done in the, in the uh, 1960s. Uh, so welcome to the East West Center. Uh, we have the president of the Pacific Forum with us, uh, Pacific Forum CSIS. We have a a little civil beat with us today as a sponsor, and Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association is co-sponsors for this event. So without further ado, uh, I will let, let you know this is being live streamed, so uh, be kind to the speakers if you ask questions, and, uh, and be articulate and loud. If not, we'll have microphones go around later, but we're going to go right into the panel and it's my great pleasure to turn over to a long-term friend and colleague and all-around good guy, super intelligent, and that's probably enough at this time around, Ralph Casa. Thank you, Richard. When we first started looking around to put this program together, we first place we went was the East-West Center to ask Richard and Karen Knudsen if they would like to collaborate with us, and of course they immediately stepped up, as they always do, in order to try to provide more information to the local community, and we're delighted to have them as a co-host, along with Civil Bead and also the Hawaii Lodging and Tourism Association. I want to say just a couple of words of introduction, and then we'll turn it over to our three panelists, who will each have about 15 minutes each to give presentations. Uh, we'll then go into a Q&A session, and our my colleague at Civil Beat, uh, Chad Blair, will then come up and, and uh, mod moderate for the uh, Q&A session. Uh, the Pacific Forum, my organization, was founded in 1975 by a Rear Admiral, Joe Vasey, who was a World War II veteran. Uh, and he believed that we had to find a better way of handling disputes than people dropping bombs on one another. So that was why he founded the Pacific Forum. Uh, Joe turned 100 in January. Uh, in March, he was writing an editorial on how we can deal with the North Koreans and offer them a grand bargain. There's a copy of it on the table over here. Uh, he's still uh, alive and well and out thinking all of us and giving us an example of what strategic thinkers do. Uh, we at Pacific Forum are one of the few institutes in the United States that actually interacts regularly with the North Koreans. I met with them in Switzerland in early September. Uh, and will share some of my own views uh, during the Q&A session. All I want to throw out here uh, as a start before turning to our three panelists is my own assessment that the odds of the North Koreans launching a nuclear tip missile against the United States anywhere and against Hawaii in particular are somewhere in the neighborhood of well less than 1%. Uh, so, <laughs> Does that mean that we should not be concerned or not be prepared? Uh, absolutely not. Uh, if I tell you there's a 1% chance that it's going to rain today, uh, you probably will go out without an umbrella. 
but if I told you there's a 1% chance that if you walk out the door on the left, someone's going to shoot you, you're probably going to walk out the door on the right. <laughs> same odds, same probability, but the consequences are a little bit different. Uh, so I, I don't uh, at all criticize the state and folks who are working on emergency preparedness. Uh, it's something that you have to do. You have to be prepared for that worst case. Uh, but I think the, the odds of this happening are in the neighborhood of less than 1%. My panelists may not agree with me, so I'll ask them in their own remarks to either uh, validate that or give uh, alternate opinions. And we're going to start with uh, someone who uh, knows North Korea, I think, as well as anyone. Uh, if you were familiar with this thing called the Six Party Talks that we had with the North Koreans for a number of years, Jim Kelly, as Assistant Secretary of State, uh, was the one who set up the Six Party Talks and was the senior U.S. representative there. Uh, he's also President Emeritus from the Pacific Forum CSIS. So, Jim, let me turn things over to you first, and then I'll introduce our other speakers when it's their turn. Please, Jim. Thank you, Ralph. Uh, if, uh, if this uh, position of the microphone uh, is... Closer is better. Yeah, closer to your, your face. Good. Like, like that. Uh, is that uh, clear? Hmm? Is this one better? <laughs> we may need karaoke. <laughs> karaoke style. But is this one on? Okay. Okay. Let's try to try to do it that way and, and just don't start singing. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry about that. Uh, what I'm gonna try to do is uh, set the stage for the perhaps better informed com uh, comments that uh, Denny and Ralph and Keith are, are going to have uh, later on. Uh, basically, I'll try to suggest uh, the answers to three questions. How did we get into this mess? And uh, why has it gone on for so long? And what's new in 2017 uh, that uh, makes uh, attitudes perhaps a little bit different? And uh, I'm only going to go back to the 1940s. Uh, with Korean questions, you can go back 4,000 years if you want, but uh, we'll uh, uh, settle for the end of Japanese control in 1945 at the end of World War II. And Russia, uh, a week before the end of World War II, entered the war in the Pacific and seized much of Korea. Uh, at that time, and rather hastily, uh, a couple of majors uh, in Washington, D.C. were sent into a back room of the Pentagon and told to come up with uh, some sort of a border uh, between uh, the Soviet zone and the American zone of, of Korea. Uh, those two gentlemen, uh, those two uh, majors uh, were uh, Dean Rust, later Secretary of State, and a uh, later general named Bonesteel. But anyway, they came up with the 38th parallel and that was sold to the uh, Soviets. Uh, and so there was uh, this first division of the Korean Peninsula at that time. And soon after, the Soviets uh, found a young 30s uh, Korean, uh, Kim Il-sung, who had been an officer in the Red Army. Uh, and they uh, got him to be the head man. That was Kim Il-sung. In the 1950s, of course, uh, the Korean War. The June 1950 attack of the South by Kim, less than a year, uh, interestingly enough, a year, only less than a year uh, after the Communist Party of China's victory uh, in the Civil War of China. And uh, uh, it's, it's important to realize that uh, China was a newly uh, established government at that time as well. Uh, in the war, uh, there was very early North Korean success, but General MacArthur, our commander in Japan of Pacific Forces, uh, had a uh, stunning uh, uh, innovation, an invasion at Incheon in uh, South Korea. It turned the tide, and the American and ROK forces and others from the United Nations uh, headed north. Uh, and uh, weren't stopping uh, until they were going to get to uh, the North Korean border with China. Uh, when China intervened with some million troops, and a, uh, uh, there was a quick reversal 
of the uh, uh, occupation of North Korea and uh, a stasis in fighting uh, that went on until 1953 when the armistice was signed, uh, an armistice that is still in effect. The demilitarized zone was set up between the two Koreas. The Korean War killed some 33,000 uh, U.S. Uh, soldiers and sailors killed in action. Uh, there were 400 of those from Hawaii among that number, uh, and not to mention, of course, uh, probably millions, certainly hundreds of thousands of Koreans who were lost in that terrible, terrible event. In the 1960s, uh, Kim Il-sung, uh, uh, operating uh, North Korea, asked uh, Stalin, the ruler of the Soviet Union, for nuclear weapons, and he turned him down. That's an interesting post-Cold War uh, development. Uh, in the South, uh, Park Chung-hee uh, uh, also uh, established a coup and, uh, and uh, took control of the South uh, Korean government. Uh, an alliance was signed uh, during that time of the U.S. and South Korea that continues to this day. Uh, there was also an economic crossover. Uh, the South uh, started doing better for the first time uh, economically than, than the North. Uh, there were also plenty of incidents. Patrol planes were shot down. The Pueblo was captured. An attack of special forces on the Blue House in Seoul uh, uh, took place. In the 1970s, the South Korean economy became strong under the harsh rule of President Park. And the um, DMZ continued to be tense. There were some axe murders in 1976 that led to a major confrontation uh, from which uh, North Korea chose to back down. Uh, and that ended. In the 1980s, uh, Olympics came to Seoul uh, and democracy. Uh, and it wasn't easy, but democracy came to South Korea and remains uh, strong there, there now. North Korean events uh, were also serious, uh, including the bombing of the South Korean cabinet, uh, killing about half of the cabinet during a visit to uh, Myanmar. Uh, there was a bomb that uh, uh, destroyed a Korean Airlines jet on a flight between uh, Dubai and Bangkok. Uh, things were certainly plenty of tense. Meanwhile, in a small area of North Korea called Yongbyon, a, uh, a smaller nuclear reactor was set up under uh, some guidance from the Soviet Union. Uh, it was completed in 1985. Uh, the DPRK, at the urging of the Soviet Union, did sign the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty at that time, although it managed to delay its safeguards agreement, which really implements the treaty, until 1992. In the 1990, the end of the Cold War meant the end of the lavish support uh, of North Korea that had been provided in the past. Cuts in this support from Russia, from China, and even from uh, Japan, uh, U.S. ally, which is an interesting story, uh, all took place. Uh, Kim Il-sung uh, passed away, and his long-prepared succession by Kim Jong-il uh, continued. Meanwhile, uh, Pakistan and Iran were starting to cooperate on missiles and nuclear activities with, uh, with North Korea. Uh, but yet there were agreements a very important agreements in 1991 and 1992 between North and South Korea, including a nuclear agreement in which both sides agreed to not be involved with, uh, with nuclear weapons. Uh, the first nuclear crisis began with the implementation of the Safeguards Agreement as the International Atomic Energy Agency inspections failed. Talks began ending in 1994 with the agreed framework a document between the U.S. and North Korea that froze nuclear programs in exchange for uh, new, less uh, adaptable nuclear reactors and oil on a monthly basis for power plants. Uh, this continued until the 2000s when a second method of developing fissionable material. North Korea, until that time, had been using plutonium. Uh, they obtained centrifuges and started a major program for enriching uranium, and that launched the second 
nuclear crisis. The six party talks involving North and South Korea, US and Japan and Russia, and really for the first and significant time, China began and, uh, uh, in September 2005, a few months after I left government, uh, a joint statement was uh, established uh, committing all of the powers to the denuclearization of the Korean, uh, military denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, this uh, uh, remains important uh, despite uh, the North Korea recent di dis uh, disavowal of it. Despite the nuclear agreement, uh, the first atmospheric test of a nuclear weapon, or the first uh, ground test, uh, was held in 2006. And in 2011, Kim Jong-un, at the age 29, took power on the death of his father, Kim Jong-il. Well, with that little history, we can see that there have been tensions for a very long time. Every American president since Eisenhower has been enormously frustrated uh, at the lack of resolution of the Korean Peninsula uh, issue, and in that sense, it's nothing new. Why has this gone on for so long? And the prime answer is that no one really wants a second Korean War. Uh, the North Korean ability, not just now with nuclear weapons, but over the years with artillery and chemical weapons to threaten Seoul, the heartbeat of South Korea, uh, the residents of 14 to 20 million uh, hardworking people, uh, is, is a reality and has been a reality for a long time. Uh, this is, North Korea, meanwhile, has been a closed society needing minimal resources. So what's new at the present, uh, present time? We have uh, several things that are different. There is an ability by North Korea, probably soon, but still in potential, to directly threaten Hawaii and the USA mainland with nuclear weapons that are mounted on ballistic missiles. Uh, this is a capability that North Korea has not had before. Uh, it's rapid testing this year, and its progress in developing the long-range missiles has clearly uh, uh, made this a potential reality. They also are showing, uh, with the recent test, enhanced nuclear weapons, a possible fusion weapon that is even more destructive than the atomic bombs itself. Meanwhile, at the same time, there are serious cyber warfare capabilities. These may not kill people on the, uh, uh, in the way that nuclear weapons potentially could, uh, but there's still a serious reality. Uh, the North Koreans were able to cheat, of all people, the Bangladeshis, out of $85 million for the cyber trick. Uh, and, and of course, uh, uh, Sony may still be licking their wounds over the, uh, the cyber attacks that they experienced and, uh, and, and others as well. Meanwhile, North Korea itself is showing some signs of relative prosperity because of the reality of the private markets that because of the starvation of the late 1990s have had to take place. There is a continued harsh rule. We have a murder trial going on in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia now of the two women who were instrumental in the murder of the half-brother of uh, Kim Jong-un of, of North Korea. On the US side, many presidential statements have certainly caused a lies concern, but the early reaffirmation by Secretary of Defense Mattis is very important. Meanwhile, the uh, statements of Secretary of State Tillerson, I think, are also, uh, uh, I find, encouraging. The concept of expended deterrence uh, in which uh, South Korea, Japan, will not choose to develop the nuclear weapons that they might choose to develop uh, are more, is more important than ever. Uh, the U.S. guarantee uh, remains in effect, although I must say that I think it's being questioned more frequently than in the past. And so with that uh, introduction, uh, now I'll give the hard part which is, what do we do about it, <laughs> to Denny Roy. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Our, our next speaker is Denny Roy here from the East-West Center. Uh, 
Denny is not only uh, an expert on North Korea nuclear activities, but even a greater expert on China and Chinese foreign policy. If you read the Honolulu Star Advertiser, you're familiar with Denny since he's quoted there about three times a week, I think, and uh, writes frequently uh, good columns uh, there that we all learn from. So Denny, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ralph. Am I being heard in the back okay? Is this okay? Okay. It'll kind of work. I, I want to stand up here because uh, if I'm sitting at the table, I think my wife is in the audience and I cannot see each other. I feel like a ro it's a Rocky and Adrian thing. All right. How's this? Yes. All right, thank you. Uh, like Secretary Kelly, I also will address three questions that I think are of interest to this audience. Why does North Korea want nuclear weapons? What can America do about it? And should the people in Hawaii be worried? Pretty, pretty straight questions, right? And I'll try to give brief but straight answers. Why does North Korea want nuclear weapons? Of course, here we're in the realm of speculation because we, we outsiders, as you know, have, have uh, great difficulty seeing into this very opaque system. And when you come across a, a commentator who says, I can tell you what the North Koreans are thinking and, 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 it, and it's a very simple answer, I would urge you to be skeptical. Unless, of course, that commentator is either Ralph or Secretary Kelly. So what I want to give you are what I think are some possible explanations or factors that may go into the North Korean thinking that has led them to conclude that, that they, they want to pay such a high cost, both in resources and in risk, to get a nuclear missile. So the, the, the first factor is domestic politics. A nuclear weapons or nuclear missile program gives legitimacy to the regime, a regime that ha has been promising to deliver economic prosperity to their people for decades and has failed miserably. Uh, so, so as very much uh, in the market for some kind of a success that it can present to its people. Joining the nuclear club is a, a huge success for North Korea. They're extremely proud of it. They're, they're, they're proud of the missile program that potentially creates the possibility of delivery of a nuclear weapon. Kim Jong-un, the current leader's father, of course, achieved the, the nuclear explosion, but uh, Kim Jong-un can now consolidate that achievement by combining it with the delivery system. Uh, the, the pride that the North Koreans have in both their missile and their nuclear program should not be estimated. I just saw, uh, I think it was this morning, a report by some American journalists uh, who traveled to North Korea and, and got shown around some of the sites. And they mentioned that, that uh, while in Pyongyang they saw a dolphin show, and the conclusion of the dolphin show in Pyongyang was giant screens showing missiles launching. You know, two, two things we ordinarily wouldn't associate with each other. So, so the, both the missile and the nuclear program are a huge boost to the domestic legitimacy of the Kim Jong-un regime. Second factor is the North Korean perception that they need a deterrence <coughs> against a possible attack by the United States or even South Korea. North Koreans very much fear absorption by South Korea. North Korea is a fundamentally weak country, uh, even in comparison with South Korea. It's got half the population of South Korea. It's got about one thirtieth of the economic capacity of South Korea. The, the average North Korean is reportedly about two inches shorter than the average South Korean, you know, which is indicative of a profound you know, difference in well-being in the two countries. Uh, so, so the North Koreans have much to fear about the idea that, that their, their regime might be extinguished and they be absorbed into what they consider to be the adversarial, the rival system in South Korea. The North Koreans have also observed that that countries that pick a fight with the United States but that don't have nuclear weapons tend to get invaded. And, and lots of visitors to North Korea come back reporting that, that uh, uh, th this is frequently brought up with their North Korean interlocutors. Uh, a third factor is that the, the North Koreans likely feel that attaining the, the, the capability to actually harm the U.S. homeland by means of a deliverable nuclear weapon will give them leveraging power, bargaining power with the United States 
that they never had before, that finally they can begin to demand negotiations with the United States about the things that they are interested in instead of the things the United States is interested in. At least one pretty serious American North Korea analyst argues that the North Koreans actually believe that once they get a nuclear missile capability, uh, they actually believe that they have some hope of winning, winning the long game. That, that is, achieving a unification of the Korean Peninsula on their terms with, with Pyongyang in charge. Not by exploding a nuclear weapon, but again by using it as leverage to force bargaining and concessions with, from South Korea and gradually first breaking the alliance with the United States and getting out American forces, then forcing the South Koreans into some kind of a federal system that would be to North Korea's advantage and eventually winning the political struggle with the remnants of the South Korean government so that they come out on top. Uh, finally, uh, another possible theory is that the North Koreans might want nuclear weapons, nu nuclear capability, uh, the, uh, the, the, the ability uh, to explode the bomb married with the delivery capability because they're preparing for serious economic restructuring. And there's two strands of the theory. One is that uh, as Kim Jong-un plans to engage in serious economic restructuring, he fears that this would be a particularly vulnerable time for the regime and fears that, that outside forces like the United States will, will pounce on this opportunity to foment subversion. So then in order to protect themselves against possible subversion while that's going on, they need to be able to threaten the United States government nu with nuclear weapons to call off their subversion campaign. Uh, second strand is that the, the North Korean government intends to demobilize much of the North Korean uh, military and put those soldiers to work as civilians in factories and power kind of an export-led uh, economic development program that, that would bring North Korea up into a high economic growth and eventually to catch up with South Korea and, and ensure a solid economic foundation for the future. Now on to the second question, what can America do about it? As you know, uh, the United States faces a list of lousy options when it comes to North Korea uh, as, as far as preventing the North Koreans from getting a nuclear missile. Uh, very generally speaking, the, the first option is to continue with the present course, which is economic sanctions gradually ratcheting up with, with every North Korean missile or nuclear test uh, in the hopes that North Korea might eventually decide that the, the hardship is too great and they agree to come to the negotiation table with their nuclear weapons uh, put on the table. Uh, in, 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 the, in the view of lots of analysts, including myself, this will not succeed in getting North Koreans uh, to give up their work on a nuclear missile before they achieve it. Uh, the achievement of which seems uh, uh, to, to be uh, now a short-term goal given the progress they've made. So that being the case, if we cont continue with the present course in the United States and do nothing else, then likely we're, we're left with, with uh, uh, accepting, not, not, not formally or officially, but, but uh, rather, rather adjusting our policy to the North Koreans having this capability. That adjustment would include reassuring our allies that they're, they continue to be under the nuclear umbrella, improving our missile defenses, continuing with the sanctions. But most importantly, Americans would have to learn to live under a greater degree of insecurity. Second option is the United States could enter into serious negotiations with the North Koreans, agreements, uh, negotiations that the North Koreans would agree to, which would mean it's not about them giving up their nuclear weapons. So the United States would, would as an opening bid, demand a, a freeze or a cap on the North Korean nuclear and missile programs. But the North Koreans would certainly, on their part, as a, as a starting point, demand acceptance, formal recognition as a nuclear weapon state, which the United States has refused to give them up until now, and also an immediate lifting of sanctions. So in effect, this would be the end of this round of the game and it would be a victory for Pyongyang. A third option would be a preventive military attack by the United States, usually envisioned as a surgical attack that would, that would try to target the, the key facilities and infrastructure that, that allow the North Koreans to, to build the missiles and, and nuclear bombs. This option is prohibitively risky to South Korea because the North Koreans might react by firing their thousands of artillery pieces and rocket launchers at Seoul, you know, which has always been their ace in the hole. Their, they're holding Seoul as a hostage. 
Furthermore, it's uncertain that's, that such an American attack, even a series of attacks, would be successful because we don't necessarily know where all the crucial infrastructure is. And it might, might simply result in a delay that, that stirs up a hornet's nest but doesn't definitively solve the problem. Uh, final option is the possibility of trying to shoot down all future North Korean missile tests uh, with the idea being that, that the North Koreans have not achieved enough progress uh, that they don't need more tests to, to, to fully consolidate their ability to effectively launch a nuclear-tipped missile somewhere and have it, have it have a chance of successfully hitting the intended target. Now, there's some risk, though, even to this option. First of all, there's a possibility that, that, that an American attempt to shoot down the North Korean missile would be a, would a public and, and very visible failure, you know, which, of course, <coughs> encourage the North Korean side and, and, and create defeatism on our side. And it's also possible that the North Koreans would retaliate even against this kind of an action, even though it's outside North Korean territory. They could argue that it's still a destruction of North Korean property or whatever, and still take serious retaliatory action against South Korea, our ally. Also, there's the problem that the North Koreans may, even up to this point, have tested enough, even if they didn't launch any further missile tests. They may have, they may have done enough now uh, to be able to claim that they already have a credible capability. And, and in fact, our side is making it easier for them to make this claim because so many responsible Americans have said, we have to assume that the North Koreans already have the capability. Finally, should people in Hawaii be worried? Let, let me divide the worry into two categories. The first is a worry about a conflict, a conflict between the United States and Korea and North Korea. And as far as the conflict between the United States and North Korea, I think there are three, three reasons why there should be some worry. The first is that there are now extraordinarily high tensions between the United States and North Korea. This is a very long-running, simmering crisis, but it's clearly reached the spike, maybe, maybe uh, the highest point in, in uh, the history of the, the nuclear issue, which goes back a couple of decades. Anytime you have high tensions between countries that are already so hostile towards each other, it's a cause for worry. Secondly, there's a high risk of miscalculation in any conflict, but it's extraordinarily high when the two sides don't know each other very well. So think about the United States and North Korea. Don't have diplomatic relations, have very little contact with each other. Thank goodness for the, there's a little bit of contact through the kind of events that Ralph organizes. But very little compared to American contact with other potential adversaries you know, throughout uh, post-war history. Very different political and strategic cultures between Americans and North Koreans. So both sides might think that, that, uh, that they, they might have confidence that they can reasonably guess what the other side would do in reaction to something they would do, uh, but err very badly with, with terrible potential consequences. Third reason we should be somewhat worried about a conflict between the United States and North Korea is that the, the, the two leaders of the two respective countries happen to be two extremely image conscious and in some ways insecure leaders who are playing to their domestic audiences. Thus, the, the consideration of, of saving face before their domestic audiences has to compete with the sound strategic advice they might otherwise be getting from their advisors and push them in a direction that's, that puts undue emphasis on saving face at home. Now maybe the, the bright side of my presentation, four reasons why we shouldn't worry so much about a strike against Hawaii, which is a good place to finish, I guess. The first reason is they simply can't do it yet. Right now they can't do it. So Ralph, right now I'd say the, the chances are zero, not one percent. Because the North Koreans have not demonstrated accuracy or survivability, only range of their <coughs> missiles. By survivability, I mean the nuclear warhead on top of a missile can go into outer space and then re-enter the atmosphere and still explode as intended. To make a football analogy, a uh, former quarterback of the Chicago Bears, also an alma mater from my college, BYU, Jim McMahon, once said, I've seen guys who can throw the ball from end zone to end zone, but they can't throw it accurately, so they're useless as a, as a pro quarterback. Similarly with North Korea, uh, to be able to, being able to fire a missile a long distance is not necessarily useful if you don't have the accuracy that goes with it. So take Hawaii in particular. Hawaii is a very small target, 
4,600 miles from North Korea. If a missile launched from North Korea toward Hawaii, even if it, 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 it flew exactly the correct distance, if the direction was off by one degree, then it would, be, it would explode so far away from the population centers that they wouldn't do any harm. So the North Koreans have yet to demonstrate either accuracy or the survivability of warhead, which is much more difficult than demonstrating range, which they've, they've done until now. Second reason not to worry as much as you might be is that I, I would argue that Hawaii is not a particularly juicy target for the North Koreans. Now, I, I, I think the, the, the fear among people in Hawaii uh, stems from a couple of mentions by the North Koreans of Hawaii as a possible target, uh, most notably in the, in the, the famous map of death you know, that you saw in the media in a photo released by the North Korean media showing a map behind Kim Jong-un with, with uh, Hawaii as a possible target. I, I think thinking about Hawaii as a possible target uh, for a North Korean missile is a relatively temporary phenomenon. It, it, it was linked to the fact that the North Koreans had not yet made sufficient progress to think about striking targets on the U.S. mainland. But once they can do that, then I, I think there will be less interest among the North Koreans in Hawaii because like the 9-11 bombers, I, I, I think they are fixed on the, the high status symbolic American targets of Washington, D.C. and New York City. So even, even the uh, propaganda videos that the North Koreans have released you know, show, show these cities being targeted. Uh, Hawaii is uh, essentially a, a logistics hub as far as the North Koreans are concerned. That's its military value. So think back to the, the last time Hawaii was attacked in 1941 by Japan. Japan was planning a campaign against Southeast Asia. It made sense to try to knock out the American Pacific Fleet beforehand. So why would make sense as a, as a target if the North Koreans were planning a long, drawn-out, methodical campaign against the United States? But I think nuclear weapons are very unlikely to be used in this way by the North Koreans. It's, it would be more a desperate, last-ditch uh, attempt to stave off some, some imminent, imminent danger to the regime in the midst of uh, a, a war that had already begun. Third, I'll, I'll be just a couple more minutes, Ralph. Third, the United States has missile defense technology. Now granted, it's, it's not perfect yet, but you can bet that lots more intention and resources will be put into this as a result of what's happening with North Korea. Uh, Hawaii does not yet have a point defense, which is a missile defense system designed to strike missiles that are, that are on the way in, that are in the, the end point of their flight. But there's been a lot of talk about adding this capability, and, and I believe it's in the works. Finally, I reemphasize that Kim Jong-un is, is not crazy and is not suicidal as far as we can tell. And, and a bolt from the blue attack on any American city or any city of, of an American ally uh, w uh, would result in the swift destruction of the regime. And I think it's safe to assume that the North Korean regime knows this and will plan accordingly. Thank you. Thank you, Denny. Our third speaker is Keith Vieira from the principal at KV and Associates Hospitality Consulting, also executive in residence at the Scheider College of Business here at UH. So, Keith. Thank you. <clears throat> You're going to quickly find out that I'm the stupidest one at the table. Um, but the good news is I'm a quick talker and I'll be short. Um, I really know nothing about what North Korea plans to do relative to um, Hawaii or, or, or their expansion plans or uh, anything like that. What I do know is a devastating effect that obviously a nuclear attack would have, uh, but the threat of a nuclear attack. Uh, as most of you are aware, over the years when we've had uh, challenging times around the world, when the SARS epidemic broke out in Asia, uh, the Japanese stopped traveling. There were afraid, concerns about going through the airport. When we suffered difficult times of 9-11, when the fear died of, uh, when the fear went away from uh, that we, then we may be bombed, it was sympathy that they had for, for Hawaii and the U.S. It wasn't a time to go over to a Hawaii or vacation when people were suffering. So uh, being a 98% leisure destination, it would be devastating to our economy. Those of you who uh, remember the times over over the years in 1968 was the first jets 
to fly to Hawaii and it changed flying times from five to six hours from the original, you know, nine, 10, 11 hours it took previously. That took a significant jump in arrivals. Uh, that took place until 1978 when you had to buy a ticket. You had to buy a group inclusive tour and those were the heyday of the, the group tours that came to Hawaii. I was a tour escort back then. It was the best years of my life. Uh, in, in 1978 was airline deregulation and that's when prices absolutely dropped. If you look back at the regulation pricing, you could buy Hawaii, New York to Hawaii for $600. You can still buy New York to Hawaii, not often, but on certain dates for $600. So when you look at our 9.1, 9.2 million visitors, you look at the cost uh, of travel that uh, has uh, greatly reduced, at least on air, air costs over the years. Uh, when you look at Hawaii's pricing, uh, we really haven't rebounded much since 07. A little but not significantly so we are a great value we are a great place to come the one thing we never talk about is we're a great safe place to come uh, you don't want to ever play that those of you who were born and raised here that's called bachi and uh, those of you who don't know what bachi is uh, i grew up in hilo and in the 60s and 70s there were a lot of earthquakes because of the volcano and I remember one, uh, I was home for Thanksgiving weekend from college and I was watching football game and my father came out of the, the shower with a pair of shorts and he said, ah, son, good shape, your father, a tough. And just coincidentally, there was a big earthquake. And when, I, and when I looked over at him, he had dropped to his knees and he was saying the Hail Mary. He was like folded hands and I said, you know, tough guy, not so tough now. But that's bachi. Uh, so we never wanted to say we were a safe place to come, yet everybody, a lot of travel promoters are aware of the military presence here, the difficulty of moving terroristic cells to Hawaii and, and having to fly in everything. So we've benefited from all of that. Um, we have had since 2009, we've, uh, we've had uh, eight straight years of continued growth. The good news is the growth has been like this, not like this. Uh, for those of you who follow things closely, we actually have 5,000 less hotel rooms than we did in 2003, yet we have two and a half more million visitors. Um, obviously, those of you who live in Kailua, you have a lot of uh, temporary neighbors. Um, we think there's about 25,000 alternative accommodations, and that's going to pose a ch challenge down the road. I mean, right now, I think it's beneficial to the industry as a whole because the two first-timers coming out to Hawaii can't really afford a lot, so they pay $80, they stay in somebody's house, they go to Costco, they buy a steak, and, and it allows them to be a first-time visitor and destination. When they come back on their wedding or come back with their family reunion, they come to Waikiki or Maui and spend more money, so right now it's beneficial. Uh, Eventually, uh, if one, we don't, we don't tax them properly, we don't monitor it properly, something bad will happen. Uh, and also, uh, what's going on in this community with you know, uh, the need for housing and, and homelessness, et cetera, we need a better plan than what's going on, on now. Um, but uh, I was very glad to hear Denny talk about that it was zero chance because even a 1% chance, I think, could easily stop the flow. You're simply not going to travel to places that you're concerned about safety. And if you're an Asian traveler, it's multiplied quite a lot. Uh, so I'd rather save any future comments for uh, questions you might have. But uh, thank you. Well, thank you very much. If I could just add a couple of very quick thoughts. I want to reinforce, I think, what, what Denny has said about the uh, number of reasons why uh, it wouldn't happen. Uh, and uh, to reinforce in particular that uh, despite some of the things you may read in the papers, uh, Kim Jong-un and the North Korean leadership are not crazy. Uh, when we say someone is irrational, what we're really saying is we don't understand their rationale. Uh, and no one does anything that they think is irrational. So you have to ask yourself, why do the North Koreans think what they're doing is rational? Uh, and for the most part, it's because it's worked. Uh, this has been a failed country that's managed to keep the U.S. and China at bay uh, and continue to uh, sort of play one side against the other and, and continue to survive. So uh, if they're crazy, they're crazy as foxes, and we shouldn't be underestimating them. Uh, but they're also, as Denny pointed out, they're not suicidal, uh, and they understand the consequences were they to ever launch an attack against the U.S. or, or one of our allies. So it's very much a uh, very last-ditch uh, effort, and when you talk with the North Koreans, uh, they will tell you that their, their nuclear weapons are for one reason only, and that's to keep us from attacking them. Uh, and uh, 
as uh, Henry Kissinger once said, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean people aren't out to get you. Uh, and uh, the North Koreans believe that uh, we're out to get them and, and uh, they're moving in that direction. Well, at this point, let me uh, introduce Chad uh, Blair. Uh, from He's the politics and opinion editor at Honolulu Civil Beat, uh, one of our co-sponsors here who's also streaming this live. So, Chad, the mic is yours. I'm going to use this mic, and uh, what I'm going to do, first of all, why is a journalist here? Keith, you're not the uh, only person who's out of their depth here with this very distinguished panel, but I could tell you he knows everything about tourism. And Ralph, thank you for an introduction. I've interviewed you several times in the past. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the journalism perspective and why Civil Beat is so interested in this situation, because even though Secretary Kelly expressed confidence in the Defense Secretary Mattis and, and Rex Tillerson, I'm not sure how long Rex Tillerson is going to be around, the way things have been going lately. And even though we have alluded to him, Denny mentioned the leader of our country, I don't believe we have a rational player in the White House. And <laughs> He's a highly unpredictable person. I do agree that he is playing to his domestic audience, but to call Kim Jong-un a little rocket man, to be leveraging China to try and cut off somehow trade with them, including oil. That's very concerning. The idea that he's saying things like, let's not waste any time negotiating. That's what got Civil Beat concerned. And so we wrote an editorial about that. And I'll get to that in just a second. But first, I want to tell you about the story that we broke about the preparations for Hawaii. So even though it's 1% or 0%, our state lawmakers decided to have a secret meeting. And we broke the story. We were tipped off by someone in the state capitol who said, you're not going to believe this, but you have lawmakers meeting in secret with officials from the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, Civil Defense, to talk about what to do and how to plan. Well, we sent a reporter, Courtney Teague, we sent our photographer, Corey Lum, and they wouldn't let us in the room, even though it was a public building, and these were our lawmakers. We did get a few photos, they did talk to us afterwards, but in a nutshell, they didn't want the public invited because they were talking about restricted information and they didn't want to scare us. <laughs> of course, it precisely had exactly that effect of frightening us. We ran the story. It, was, it just got picked up everywhere. Courtney was interviewed by National Public Radio, by CBS. Um, who else interviewed her? Many other publications. Uh, Washington Post, CBS News. And even though they had a meeting two days later that was in public, by then, the story that Hawaii had a secret meeting about nuclear preparation just went everywhere. We were picked up by Fox, US News and World Report, San Francisco Chronicle, Seattle Post Intelligencer, Politico, Political Wire, The Bulletin, NTD Television, China, US, and Global News Canada. Here is the headline from Newsweek. Hawaii readying, readying for nuclear attack in secret meeting to avoid panic. <laughs> it's just, that's just amazing. Which leads me uh, to the second of three points that I want to mention. On everybody's chair, I didn't put this here, but somebody provided the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency's talking points about how to prepare for attack. Uh, you might just grab them. I'm not going to read every single one of them. I am going to call attention to a couple because we did our own research on this. Um, we first ran an editorial in which we ran an illustration on what a 150 kiloton weapon, what kind of impact it would have on Pearl Harbor. The Star Advertiser did a similar illustration on their front page, and you can imagine the concentric circles and how far the nuclear damage would spread. Um, it was picked up nearly 5,000 times on our website, and I'm only going to call attention to a couple of things uh, that uh, are not on that list that we added just for your edification, if you do want to prepare, 0% or 1% or not. They say have 14 days supply of water and food. I actually got a call from someone saying, you forgot to add medication. Good point. A second thing, uh, you know there are no designated blast protection areas, no defense areas that we can run to here in Hawaii. They just don't exist. If for some reason you did have to run, we are advised, Go to a public building, concrete structure, ideally go into a basement. We at Civil Beat have a plan in jest to go to Tamura's Liquor first 
and then go to the fifth floor parking garage uh, at Civil Beats headquarters on YLI. I say that jokingly, but it, it does make one stop and think, what would you do if you had 15 minutes? 15 minutes. Don't do this. Don't get in your car and drive somewhere because it'll just cause chaos. Don't think you can make it over to Kailua or Kaneohe. That is an unwise decision is what I'm told. Uh, do not look at the flash of the explosion. I wouldn't think that would be a no-brainer, but in this Instagram generation that we live in, maybe it's not. So as you can imagine, that got a lot of attention. Now having said that, on a very serious note, I'm very skeptical about the survival of a nuclear attack. I, this document here says there's a 90% survival rate. Having grown up in the Marshall Islands, having met people from Bikini and Anahuitoc and Rongalap, and having seen through firsthand experiences from people sharing their stories about what happened with the nuclear testing in the 40s and 50s, it's still irradiated up to this point. There are islands you cannot inhabit. There are entire craters in the reef in Bikini and Anahuitoc in which nuclear explosions evaporated islands. I just don't see how you can survive. Even if you were here in Hawaii in the late 50s and early 60s, before my time, you might remember being able to see the red explosion from Johnston Atoll when they were testing the nuclear weapons there. I just, I think it's really hard to imagine surviving such a thing. Okay, the final point I want to make before I uh, turn it over to uh, you for your questions to our panelist. There was a story just this week about the email from the University of Hawaii. A University of Hawaii email that went out Monday with the subject line, in the event of a nuclear attack, generated international media attention and a policy, apology from a school spokesman. That was breaking just this week. Finally, just some current news. Nancy Pelosi today is seeking a new law to limit the president's use of nuclear weapons unless we are attacked first. Clearly, the minority leader in the House is concerned about the person who has access to the nuclear codes. So am I. Okay, the final thing I'll say is uh, thank you for listening to civilbeat.org and subscribing and joining in and following us. And now I'd like to turn it over to anybody that has questions. We have live microphones, I believe. One over here. Ma'am, right up here I see someone. And another person and another. Derek, it's right behind you. You hold it for me? Uh, All right, thank you. <laughs> All right. Um, there are a couple of comments. Thank you very much for your comments. And um, I think that uh, actually climate change is going to get us way before the nuclear proliferation will get us. And uh, things that we can gather from the experience of Puerto Rico, another island, uh, right now there is still 85% of the island with no power whatsoever. And they, are, they have to drink water from the Superfund wells, which are polluted because the help hasn't gotten there. So we know that we cannot expect any kind of aid or help from the federal government. In that case, if anybody survives, it would be a great thing if we can fend for ourselves. It would be a matter of state security. And we are not gonna be able to do that in our current position in which we import 90% of the food that we consume. Even if we could stock up on 14 days of camp food and whatever, you know, after that, then what? If we were able, as when the Europeans first came over here, to sustain a population of more than one million people with taro patches and fish ponds mostly, then another thing, you know, which we should have hope for hope. But there is this right now, you know, there is out in the legislature, yeah, we're gonna have, you know, um, uh, we want to be self-sufficient. We want to take care of you know, this percentage of our chores by the year 2045. But then it's very easy to put that on paper, and there is no connection in between where we are now and how to get there. And another thing is that you know, we keep paving over agricultural lands, and we keep doing all kinds of stuff, enhancing tourism. And I want to see if a nuclear attack occurs, where tourism is going to get us. Thank you. Keith, did you want to say anything about that? You brought up tourism. <laughs> it would devastate us, our economy, everything. And you wouldn't be allowed to even make comments like that because we couldn't survive. Um, so 
I mean, I think on a, on a broader scale, what are all the alternatives? I mean, it's always easy to say about tourism growth concerns, and we should be. I mean, it's an island community, and we have to live and work together. But again, you have to look at what alternatives are there. Uh, OK, thank you. More questionaries right over here. And then we'll, you want to come over here? Jerry, first with you. Thank you for an eloquent uh, overview of the subject. And it's so important to have safe, understandable, simple, reassuring perspectives from a diversity of professionals. We thank you very much. Former Secretary of State uh, James Kelly was uh, mentioning the history. And he explained that Russia had taken control in the last week of World War II and installed a military dictator at that time. To what extent uh, are the current um, dictators of North Korea puppets or pawns of Putin's policies? Putin has uh, been extremely aggressive in Crimea and Georgia and other forms of uh, ag aggression. And he appears to be asserting a tremendous amount of territorial power, and it seems consistent with KGB policies of creating conflict, that this is simply a puppet expressing uh, exacerbation of the Pacific uh, aloha. And we have here the great traditions of aloha. We respect the international aloha of multicultural traditions where Koreans uh, participate in celebrations and joyful tourism from all parts of the world, it seems that there is a specific malicious intent from not only North Korea, but from Putin to disrupt that uh, type of um, economic tourism when they are isolated from the sanctions and have been uh, blamed for meddling in the elections. It's a retaliatory policy. Could you speak to some of the puppet principles or theories? Seems like for Secretary Kelly, Denny, Ralph. Well, first, uh, thank you for those uh, questions. Um, I don't think North Korea or South Korea, for that matter, are anybody's puppets. Uh, uh, not now. Uh, perhaps at the beginning, historians could argue when between 1946 and 1954 or whatever. Uh, it is true that Kim Il-sung, uh, the grandfather of the present leader, uh, did go to Moscow and he asked Stalin's permission uh, to begin the, uh, uh, the attack on, on the South in uh, 1950, uh, but, uh, uh, and he got an okay, uh, but he was also told that he would not get any military help from, uh, from the Soviet at that time. Uh, there were major purges, I think, in North Korea in 1957 of uh, Soviet liners. Uh, the fact is, in the six-party talks uh, some uh, 15, 16 years ago, uh, uh, the Russian participants uh, were by and large quite helpful uh, and were uh, certainly uh, uh, disliked by the, by the North Koreans. So uh, uh, that may be something out of the past but I don't think it's a major consideration in the, in the current time. Russia is pursuing uh, what it considers to be its own interests. Uh, at times, those are certainly things that Americans uh, won't be very happy about. But uh, uh, bossing uh, Koreans around uh, is uh, no longer a strategy that works. Yeah, I, I might just add, Chris, again, a very good question, but uh, I've met quite frequently with, with Russian North Korea specialists, uh, and up until about three years ago, uh, the Russians were very antagonistic toward the North Koreans. They thought they a bunch of annoying folks who we need to sort of put down, and Putin had no time for the North Korean leadership at all. So I asked them, what's changed? Why is it now that Russia seems to be uh, more of a problem and seems to be somewhat supportive of North Korea? Uh, and my Russian friend told me, it's an order to make you mad. Uh, essentially, North Korea has provided an opportunity for the Russians to sort of poke us back. 
as we've been poking them for Crimea and other things. But there's still no great love lost and no trust between the Russians and the North Koreans. Uh, and as Jim said, the North Koreans don't do anyone's bidding but their own. Uh, we've been, I think, very naive uh, in expecting that the Chinese could somehow or other tell the North Koreans what to do. Uh, and again, uh, the Chinese have been very frustrated. I think there's more the Chinese could do and should do, uh, but this is not a matter of the Chinese telling the North Koreans to jump and they ask how high. Their response would be something different than how high. Danny, did you want to add anything to that? I think these two covered it. Okay, great. Let's take two questions from this side of the room. Who has the microphone? Yes, sir. Hi. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, I had a question regarding uh, Mr. Roy's uh, option of uh, surgical precise against the North Korean key facilities. Um, given that President Trump ran on a platform of America first, is there a chance, what are your thoughts on the likelihood that they might, uh, that President Trump might sacrifice Seoul in favor of, say, uh, San Francisco? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, President Trump, we could, we could add, also said that uh, North Korea will not get the capability as candidate, will not get the nuclear missile capability. Uh, if, um, if, if, American, the American public was asked, uh, uh, we'll, we'll let you choose from two possible policies. Uh, choice A is, is um, uh, the security for the United States and for a close ally will be slightly reduced. Right? Choice B is American security will not be reduced at all, but the security for an American ally will be dramatically reduced. Which would you choose? And I, I fear that, that uh, uh, and Trump may be in this camp, some Americans would choose option B. And if, if, when we talk about a, a possible American military action against North Korea, this is essentially the, 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 the choice that we're talking about because everyone recognizes that there's a very high likelihood that, that uh, the North Koreans would take out their frustrations against someone who was within reach and Seoul is most within reach. Uh, so. When you combine uh, the pledge that North Korea won't get this missile and the American first thinking, then I think there are, there are some grounds for worry. Uh, at the same time, uh, I, I take heart from uh, my observation that every time the United States has, including during the Trump administration around springtime, every time the United States has, has seriously thought about using nuclear, uh, sorry, military action against North Korea in connection with, with uh, the, this nuclear crisis, that our government always comes around to the decision that, that uh, it's, it's far better to try something else first. And I believe that, again, to reiterate, I believe that the American policy that we will settle on is to continue as we are now and to bypass the military intervention option and to deal with the consequences later. Hi, my name is Christine On. I'm the international coordinator of an organization called Women Cross DMZ. It's a, it's a movement of women mobilizing for peace on the Korean Peninsula. And um, I'm really happy that there is so many people gathered here and that East West Center is hosting this event. But it is 2017 and Hawaii is 75% people of color. And it's kind of astounding to me that at an academic institution like the East West Center, we have largely men, and I, I appreciate the distinguishedness, but it's largely men, it's, there's no women, there's no Korean, and uh, there's not much of a diversity of views. Um, while I agree with some of the points that have been made, I just think there has been some selective half-truths that have been told in this, uh, on this panel. And I think, uh, I just wanna make th three quick points and then ask a question. So the first point is, um, we are in this crisis today with North Korea because we totally destroyed North Korea. So when Donald Trump says we're gonna de totally destroy North Korea, we already did that during the Korean War. Four million people were killed, 85% of North Korea was completely bombed to bits. So if you think that North Korea is just using it for domestic politics, there's a real reason why North Korea is terrified as they are and is seeking a nuclear deterrence. The second point is Diplomacy has worked. Uh, I'm, I'm very familiar with uh, former Secretary of Defense, William Perry, who is the one that negotiated in 1994 the agreed framework that froze North Korea's nuclear programs. 
It prevented them from creating up to 100 nuclear weapons. Diplomacy has worked. It can work again. And um, the third point I want to make, which um, Professor Roy kind of alluded to, but I think to frame it a different way is that given the question that you asked about Seoul being basically in the crossfire of a North Korean counterattack, by not negotiating with North Korea, Trump is basically making a moral calculus. He is saying, by not talking to the North Korean leader, he's willing to sacrifice 50 million people in South Korea, 25 million people in North Korea, how many millions of 75 million people in Japan, Guam, Hawaii, the US? I mean, it's a moral calculus. I think there is, there's nothing to be confused about. I think it's very clear. And so the question I have for the panel is, is there any other option besides negotiation? And if, as, as Ralph Kosa has said, there's very little chance of a North Korean strike on the US, why wouldn't we negotiate? Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll jump into that. Uh, the question is not, are we willing to negotiate? I think the Secretary of State has made it very clear that he is prepared to negotiate, that they're trying to find ways to negotiate. Uh, when I talk with the North Koreans, they're not very interested right now in negotiating. Uh, what they're interested in is continuing to pursue their nuclear capability until the point where they feel secure. I think then they will come to the table and negotiate. I would say three months from now, four months from now, we'll be analyzing the new North Korea peace offensive uh, and what it means. But then, what are they prepared to negotiate and what are they prepared to give up in return for assistance? The North Koreans want economic assistance, they want economic development, uh, but the previous negotiations fell apart uh, at the point where we wanted verification that they were giving up their nuclear weapons in return for this economic development. The North Koreans walked away from that table, not the United States. That's been the challenge. That continues to be the challenge. So I, I, you know, I know groups like yours have the greatest of intentions, uh, but I think that you have to spend a little bit more time understanding the North Koreans and what's in it for them and what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, and uh, they are not easy people to deal with or to negotiate with. But diplomacy is the best option, and that has been made clear by everyone in the last five or six administrations. Uh, but the point is that so far uh, they have not been able to reach any type of conclusion uh, because the North Koreans are dead set on moving in a certain direction and until they get there, uh, it's very hard uh, to move in that, that path. So people are trying and I think our, we have very accomplished diplomats who are trying to, to be diplomatic. Uh, I think some of the president's comments have not been helpful at all. Uh, and uh, that's I, I think goes without saying most people have have said it and reset it and reset it again uh, but while I don't think Kim Jong-un is crazy I don't think Donald Trump is crazy either uh, and I think he's sort of playing this good cop bad cop thing right now I don't think it'll work I think it's a bad idea uh, but the you know Check the military bases here. People aren't mobilizing. Uh, they're not getting into battle positions. We're not sending more troops to the Korean Peninsula. There's a whole list of things that would be happening if we were getting prepared for military action in North Korea, uh, against North Korea. And none of those things are happening. So civil beat needs to beat their drums, and that's fine. But they need to sort of be a little bit more realistic uh, about, uh, you know, it's, it's one thing to, to warn people. It's another thing to try to scare people. Uh, I think we're at the point where we ought to be warning, but we shouldn't be at the point where we're trying to scare. Uh, and that, I think, is the, where responsible uh, people uh, ought to be. So that's, that's my two cents. I don't know if others want to add. Back and forth this side of the room. Derek? Hi, thank you for some great comments. Um, the country which is at uh, greatest risk and most imminent risk is South Korea. Um, with which we have lots of trade, source of investment, many tourists here in Hawaii, and lots of students. So I have four very closely related questions. What does South Korea see as the policy options? What would South Korea like us to do? How should we take into account what South Korea thinks? 
and what would be the impact if something happened in South Korea. So my basic question is, what's South Korea's views on this? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm absolutely... I'm absolutely delighted to have you ask that question, uh, Ambassador Moriarty. Uh, the truth is uh, that uh, South Koreans have the greatest stake in all of this, although I suppose you could say the North Koreans, at least uh, those who are not members of the Kim family or their uh, chosen retainers, uh, are, have a major stake in this. Uh, one of the uh, attitudes in Washington that I most uh, dislike is uh, seeing this constantly in terms of the U.S. and North Korea. Uh, South Korea uh, has accomplished so much, uh, their danger is far greater than our own, and uh, that needs to be kept in mind uh, all the time, and I think it's important that you, you brought that up. Uh, South Korea has a new president, democratically elected. Uh, it has a, a responsible government. It is one that we need to consult with and listen to what they have to say because what they have to say is uh, very important in any strategy that we uh, develop. And it's also very important in the talks. Uh, I consider the greatest achievement, uh, the truth is the six party talks failed to denuclearize North Korea uh, it failed to uh, uh, obtain peace. But it did include, for the first time, uh, the South Koreans as uh, key partners in this uh, negotiating process. And that, I think, is something that can't be lost sight of. Over here, I think. Jenny, did you want to add something? Please. I'm not sure if the Trump administration is actually committed to preventing the North Koreans from getting a nuclear missile at all costs. They, uh, they, they have more or less said so. Uh, but if that is in fact the case, then it, it will raise uh, a very difficult issue of will the, the, will the United States, uh, as a last resort, cons seriously consider military action over the objections of our South Korean ally? Uh, however, I, uh, my prediction is that will not happen. I think the United States will, 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 will learn to live with a nuclear North Korea in the end. Thank you. Over here, who has the mic? Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. I wanted to uh, Jim Kelly talked about he started at the end of World War II, but I'd like him to back up a little bit that I read this book a number of years ago about the Japanese attempts to develop nuclear weapons in World War II. And as I recall, there was one... The Army had one uh, center at Riken Center, and the Navy had a center in North Korea where there was a lot of water power, and they could, it was a heavy water thing, I think, like the Germans are trying to do. And uh, so I was wondering, is there truth to that, that the, the Japanese were developing a nuclear weapon in Korea in World War II, and was any of that left over for the Koreans to build on up to their present point? I'm not really aware of what kind of program uh, for nuclear weapons the Japanese had, uh, uh, so I, the answer is I don't know on that. The Germans had some kind of a program that apparently wasn't quite as far advanced, uh, but that was certainly part of the urgency of the Manhattan Project in the U.S. at, at, at that time. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, there was nothing left over that North or South Korea could build on. I think this is uh, all of their nuclear programs have been derived uh, uh, from the work of others. And, and having uh, Koreans that uh, went to school, whether in Eastern Europe or Western Europe or USA, and, and uh, uh, there are plenty of excellent physicists and other uh, technical people that have, have done a lot of work in that line. Over here, who has the microphone? Yes, sir. Oh, pardon me. <clears throat> As I understand it, two of you gentlemen have been eyeball to eyeball with a North Korean. Is that correct? correct. Okay. Sure. Question. If they agree to something, can you trust them? <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> it would depend on what they, they agree on. Uh, uh, North Korean diplomats are going to fulfill their talking points. Uh, uh, it's, it's really kind of interesting. Uh, they follow their orders and seem frankly to be vividly aware that if uh, they get their talking points wrong, uh, they and their families uh, may be in a concentration camp the following week. Uh, this uh, is a strong incentive to get your talking points right and uh, not uh, deviate uh, from them. And that's been the experience uh, I have, have had uh, with, uh, with these uh, gents. So uh, it's not what an individual uh, trust or lack of trust may involve. It's uh, where does the statement that is being made emanate and what kind of authority is behind it. It's an alternate member, yeah. Is that a significant happening? Yeah, I, I think it is. I, I think what they're trying to do is, first of all, continue to legitimize the family. And the sister and him are both from a different mother than the, the two older uh, brothers, one of whom has been already put to death, and the other one, I'm sure, is walking very carefully and, and silently. I'll return this, but I would like to go back to history a little bit. There are no Carthaginians on this earth today. Hannibal was able to go over the Alps with his elephants. He brought Rome to their knees, sat outside Rome, and refused to go in and take care of them. What do you think Rome did in history? They did it in reverse, so the people who didn't stand up when they needed to ended up being the losers, and they're not here anymore. I suggest we have to stop the nonsense at some point. Thank you. Hi, my name is Andre. I'm a visiting fellow at the East West Center and Pacific Forum. Um, it's my second day in Hawaii, so this is quite the welcome. All death and destruction. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, I've had the fortune or misfortune to have been to North Korea a lot over the last several years, and they've been very, very consistent, as Ralph can attest to, over the last six or at least seven years, that denuclearization is never going to happen. So I have two questions. One, if we trust that that is the case, and I think most North Korea watchers believe that is the case, how do we learn to live with uh, nuclear North Korea? And in the short term, with an escalating crisis in which uh, there are two leaders that seem fairly prideful and uh, have amped up rhetoric, and sanctions and the testing schedule on the North Korean side with this intensity, how do we walk back from, from what is an increasingly dangerous situation? Gentlemen, who wants to take that? Well, uh, Audrey, thank you for the question. And, uh, and again, uh, we're delighted to have you at the Pacific Forum. And we'll now give you those two questions to answer as part of your research while you're uh, <laughs> while you're at the forum, and I'll be, uh, I'll be delighted to hear your, your response. Uh, I, I, I would agree that it's a very consistent line on the part of the North Koreans that we are not going to, to denuclearize. Uh, I also agree that you never say never. Uh, it's a cost-benefit analysis. Right now, the cost associated with uh, having, uh, giving up North Korea uh, weapons exceed the cost to them of, of keeping them. Uh, Every administration in, for the last couple, and I think this one as well, has essentially been following what I call the Santana approach. We're trying to make them change their evil ways. Uh, and it's, you, know, and it, you do that by trying to increase the costs associated with having the nuclear weapons. Uh, there is probably a point at which that would work, uh, but it's very difficult for that to work if it's only the United States doing it, or if, if essentially the Chinese and the Russians are not cooperating. I think part of what this administration's been trying to do is scare the Chinese or compel the Chinese to be uh, even harder on the North Koreans. Will it work or not? Who knows? At the end of the day, the North Koreans' number one uh, objective, the only thing that all the, quote, experts agree on, is survival. Uh, and they right now believe that survival is associated with having nuclear weapons. Uh, if you can convince them that survival is associated with giving up nuclear weapons in order to get economic benefits, uh, 
then perhaps things will change. I don't think we have a good strategy to get there, so I'm, I'm not counting on that, but uh, I, I think that's what people have been trying to do and what they, what they continue to try to do. Uh, in the meantime, uh, rhetoric is, is fine, but uh, particularly in North Korea, you know, we've had this rhetoric for years. Uh, some people now seem to think that matching this kind of silly rhetoric is somehow in our national interest. Uh, I don't particularly follow that point of view, uh, but you can turn it off tomorrow. Uh, and then we sort of de-escalate. So I'm, I'm not of the group, I, you know, I think it's crazy. I pick up the newspaper and people are talking about, it's the new Cuban Missile Crisis. You know, I've, I'm old enough to remember the real Cuban Missile Crisis. We had two nuclear powers, both capable of destroying the world, you know, a hundred times over, uh, who were playing nuclear chicken. This was a, a nuclear crisis. This was something serious. Here you've got the North Koreans who probably can't even get in one lucky shot, but if they were able to do that, they'd be removed from the face of the earth. There's nothing mutual about that assured destruction. So uh, talk is, is, is fine, it sells newspapers, it gets people excited, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, rational actors normally prevail, uh, and I think we've already seen a lessening of that in the last week or so, uh, and that will probably, in my view, continue. Uh, they say uh, patience is a godlike virtue. Thank you very much for allowing me to uh, ask the question. Um, I first wanted to thank you for keeping us informed and keeping uh, the pulse at the heartbeat of the foreign policy. I had, you kind of stole my question because I was going to ask you the question about how uh, can you make some type of analogies between the Cuban Missile Crisis and the North Korean crisis. That was one question. And then the other partial question was I sat in a seminar at the East West Center uh, about a week ago and a member, former ambassador, was telling me that some of the dilemmas that are happening in North Korea are, are as a result of the absence of the church that used to be once um, involved, uh, the religious community that used to be once involved in North Korea at one given time. Could you also speak to that? I, I'm completely unaware of that myself, but uh, Jim, we're going to... Well, once upon a time in North Korea, I think that's a true statement, that at one time uh, before the, uh, the, the 1940s and 1950s, uh, there was a greater uh, inclusion of Christianity uh, among uh, North Korean citizens, and Pyongyang was, was essentially the, the, the main part of that. And, and uh, that is, uh, there's a grand tradition in Korea of uh, of Christian missionaries and indigenous uh, uh, people now uh, who has been the main source of assistance for uh, uh, Korean defectors, North Korean defectors or refugees, whatever you may choose to, to call them, who have uh, made it out of there, often with the support. The American uh, uh, Human Rights Act, which was passed, I think, around 2004 by the US Congress, was very much stimulated by grassroots uh, uh, Christians uh, uh, working with uh, Korean Christians about doing that. But of course, uh, North Korea has maintained an anti-religious uh, policy over these times. Uh, there are, I think, uh, uh, some nominal churches in, uh, in Pyongyang, but uh, I don't think it's very broad otherwise. Uh, there are some religious visits, and there are others uh, uh, that have, have very quietly uh, done a lot of serious work. For example, the uh, foundation, uh, the Eugene Bell Foundation uh, that uh, assists uh, uh, the drug resistance tuberculosis uh, cases uh, and has uh, done uh, uh, some extraordinary work in North Korea uh, providing these drugs uh, to patients who have the drug-resistant tuberculosis, which is still a, a major problem in, in North Korea. Uh, 
Yeah, no, and I mean, to, to reinforce Jim, Jim's point, uh, there's only one religion allowed in North Korea, and that's worshiping the Kim family. Uh, and it is, in fact, like a religion. Uh, this, is, this is, you know, complete devotion to the Kim family. Uh, nothing will get you shot faster in North Korea than disrespecting the leader. Uh, and that has included even other members of his family who uh, slept through one of his speeches or something. So uh, it's also very interesting that many of the people who defect from North Korea, first of all, they're helped by Christian groups who are part of this underground railroad to get them through China and into Mongolia or Thailand or somewhere and eventually to South Korea. And many of them quickly embrace Christianity and it's like they're looking for something new to believe in. They need to have something to sort of replace that Kim worship. Uh, on the, uh, on the, the uh, missile crisis, we, you know, I, in my view, we're not at the Armageddon stage and we're not at the Cuban missile crisis stage. And when we talk about that, the North Koreans love it. Uh, and the reason they love it is I've been dealing with the North Koreans now for many years, as, as have Jim. Uh, they used to try to say, we're, we're like India or Pakistan. You need to treat us like them, you know, de facto nuclear weapon states, and you, know, you have dealing with them. Now, when you talk to them, they say, we're the new Soviet Union. Uh, we're one nuclear superpower to the other. Uh, so when we start talking about Cuban Missile Crisis, it reinforces in the North Koreans' mind that they really are this great, powerful, state who has the world trembling at, at its edge and that it can, you know, they keep talking about, we can destroy the United States. Well, somebody better get out a map and let them see just how big the United States is. And, you know, one nuclear weapon will do terrible things wherever it lands, but that's it. And that's not destroying the United States. So we, we shouldn't be feeding that delusion uh, by continually making them sound like they are the new Soviet Union because they're not. Add a bit on. Just a reminder, there is coffee and water and cookies in the background, so help yourself. Go ahead. One of the things we rarely talk about is, is the, the problem of reintegrating North Korean society and South Korean society after reunification takes place. It will, it will happen sometime. Uh, we, at the moment, it looks like it's far distant, but we don't know. It could be sooner than we think. And I, I think we often underestimate uh, the the dif uh, some of the difficulties we the, the, there are obvious difficulties in the the different economic levels right uh, South Koreans are relatively rich North Koreans are relatively poor North Korean infrastructure would have to be completely rebuilt and so on but we think less about the mental cultural differences you know, that no North Koreans are are not brought up to think in the same way as as educated people in developed countries uh, that you see when uh, uh, North Korean defectors uh, relocate to South Korea and have difficulty making it in South Korean society. There are many stories like this. So imagine that on a huge scale. And it's w w when this happens, and I hope it's sooner rather than later, uh, it's at that time that I think the, the religious groups in South Korea will be extremely useful in, in helping to act as a bridge in this reintegration. And if there is some residual religious feeling still in North Korea after you know, many, many decades of the government trying to snuff it out, then that could act as a, a, a kind of a facilitator in bringing those two peoples together. I think the first generation will probably be, be lost, but uh, at least the young people will have something to build on in, in making the, the two halves of Korea a single society again. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a couple more questions. It would be nice to break just in time to come up and say hello to our guests. I know there are more people around this side of the room. The microphone is over there. Uh, <clears throat> Annyeonghashimika. Aloha. Greetings. Uh, my name is uh, Yoon Bok Dong, a.k.a. Andre Hall. I'm a uh, Korea War orphan from way back. I was born in 52 during the war. Uh, I was also invited. I was participated in the first international peace and unification of Korea in July 1989. And I was sent down at the DMZ looking down to the south, I was shown a picture of, not a picture, but a, uh, a scene of a, a concrete wall, a ferro concrete wall, separating north and south, which was built in the late 1970s by the mil U.S. military uh, army of engineers. 
it goes from east to west, and the only thing that separates it would be the mountains and the rivers. Uh, what I'm asking, when I look down there, and also I participated in, in a, uh, <coughs> a Korean adoptee gathering in, in 2007, first trip home, and on both times I asked myself, how many military bases, foreign military bases, is there in the continental United States, and for that matter in Hawaii? Nei. But then when I looked at the north, when I was in the north and in the south, the north has none, no for, for military bases. The south has over 83, the last count that I remember years ago, 83 small and large military, U.S. military bases and installations. And uh, my belief, and I would like to ask, why doesn't the uh, United States allow the North and the South to come together to have a peace you talk, reunification talks? You talked about a six-party six talk, but what the North wants, the DPRK and the South ROK should want, is a, uh, a peace, a reunification discussion between both and calling for the withdrawal of U.S. troops from the Korean Peninsula, which is a hindrance to peace in the Korea Peninsula. Thank you. I, mean, I, I will tell you that every conversation I have with the North Koreans, the first thing I tell them is that the road to Washington runs through Seoul. And the first thing they tell me is we have no interest in talking with the South Koreans. We want to talk with the United States. Uh, I don't think the U.S. has been the impediment to North-South rapprochement. Uh, it's been uh, basically the North Koreans as part of their uh, propaganda, as part of their reason for being. Uh, they have to believe that they're the only legitimate government of the entire Korean Peninsula. Uh, South Koreans uh, argue that as well, but the South Koreans have been much more open to the idea of having dialogue with the North. Uh, as, as Jim said earlier, one of the great accomplishments of the six party talks was bringing the South Koreans into the room and forcing the North Koreans to talk with them. Uh, but that's been a very difficult challenge. Uh, the current president in South Korea would love nothing more than to sit down and talk with the North Koreans. Uh, and he's made that extremely clear. He made that clear when he was running for office. He's made that clear since he came in office. And the North Koreans have made it very clear they have no interest in, in talking with him. And that's one of the great frustrations in South Korea today. No. This side. Someone who hasn't had a chance to speak. Yes, sir. Okay. The mic. Yeah, I'm Sanat Disilvak uh, from APLP program, East West Center. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Kosa about, uh, you know, we are talking about two, uh, two states which is very powerful and which is very less powerful, very imbalanced situation of when we talk about the balance of power. We are used to balance of power situations in the Cold War, but the matrix here is very different. So when it comes to the risk and vulnerability assessment, I mean, having that in your backdrop, you said that within uh, another four months time, when they feel secure, they might come to the table to talk. What are they going to achieve in four months' time? And how do they feel secured more? What is, what is the gap? I, I think the North Koreans, when they are convinced that we are convinced that they can strike the mainland United States with a nuclear weapon, then they will feel secure enough to come back to the bargaining table and talk. However, they will not come back to talk about giving up that nuclear weapons. Uh, they'll probably come back and be willing to halt testing, for instance, since they're already done accomplishing what they need in the testing uh, in return for, for financial aid or lifting of sanctions. Uh, I don't think that's a particularly good deal, uh, but I think that many people, uh, including s some in administrations both in South Korea and the U.S., uh, would declare victory and, and accept the deal like that. I think we have to be very careful about it, quite frankly. But the North Koreans right now, in, in my view, and I should, should have caveated everything I said by when it comes to North Korea, we're all guessing. Uh, and anyone that tells you they're an expert on North Korea is either trying to fool you or fool themselves. But uh, my guess is uh, that once they are convinced that we're convinced of that, uh, then they'll come in and try to sell us uh, their tests uh, in return for financial aid. Uh, and then it'll be a question of how much uh, 
we're prepared to give and what we're expecting in return. And then the real hard negotiations will begin. That, that may not happen. I, you know, I'm predicting what North Korea will do or what will happen in North Korea is sort of a fool's errand. So, but that's, that's my best guess. Hi, good evening. Uh, Steve Kaiser, thanks for a very uh, interesting panel and questions. I have uh, two fairly unrelated questions. Uh, the first one has got to do with um, civil-military relationships. Um, when North Korea uh, several weeks ago said that their initial target was going to be Guam and they were going to bracket the island, uh, suddenly the, the residents of Guam uh, said, well, wh why us? And well, it's because we have a lot of U.S. military bases on here. Uh, and and uh, up until that point, uh, there there's generally pretty good civil military relationships on Guam. Now, let's bring this scenario here to Hawaii, where uh, there's been more of a challenge between the military presence and, and the Hawaiian uh, nation. Um, if there is more of a threat to this island, what will that do to U.S. military Hawaiian nation relationships that are already somewhat strained? So that's question number one. Uh, question number two has got to do with China. At what point do you think um, the, the instability on the Korean Peninsula or the unpredictability of the Korean Peninsula will get to a point where China may choose to invade North Korea? Mr. China expert. <laughs> you, you want to do question one first? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so, so the question is, what would it take for China to invade North Korea? Um, I think uh, use of a nuclear weapon by the North Koreans. Short answer. Do you care to answer the national Hawaiian question? Well, we, we see something similar on, on Okinawa. There, there, there's an argument that, that um, uh, Japan and particularly Okinawa, and of course the Okinawans have, have their, uh, uh, there's an Okinawan point of view separate from the Japanese point of view. Uh, uh, a lot of people on Okinawa argue that, that even Japan, let alone Okinawa, certainly Okinawa, need not uh, be part of, of, of a, a game among larger powers. It's, it's, it's unnecessarily dragged into a contest between larger powers. And, and therefore, the argument is if we could get the U.S. military out of Okinawa, then, then Okinawans could live in peace. Uh, so you can imagine that kind of a, uh, an argument being raised in Hawaii also. There, there, I mean, there's something to build on uh, to begin with, obviously, with, with uh, uh, there, there's a you know, fair amount of sentiment already in Oahu that, that uh, the island's been taken over by American militarism and, and we'd like to see it go. So this would, be, this would give impetus to that, to that kind of feeling. But that, that would posit a, a, a scenario where there's a, greatly raised sense of threat that persists over a long period of time, right? So we're not sure if the future will play out that way. We're not sure where this current spike in this U.S.-North Korea crisis is going to go. Will there be some kind of a resolution? Will there be uh, uh, an understanding on both sides? Uh, w once, as I predict, uh, once North Korea has the capability, that's the end of, uh, of one game and the beginning of another, and then there are all kinds of different possibilities, at least several different possibilities from there. And we cannot rule out the possibility of a recalculation by North Korea that makes a reduction, a permanent reduction, or a long-term reduction of tensions possible. Thank you. Let, let me reinforce yeah, one other point, though, because it, it's important to get facts straight. Uh, the North Koreans never threatened to attack Guam. What the North Koreans said they were going to do was to demonstrate their ability by doing missile tests on four sides of Guam just to show us that they were capable of doing that. But not, they didn't say that they were going to do that with nuclear weapons, and they didn't say they were going to attack Guam per se. Uh, quite frankly, uh, Guamanians seem to be more concerned about the impact that that might have on tourism to Guam uh, than impacts of North Korean missiles on Guam. And I think that that's probably the same exact thing here and part of what we've been discussing. We're much more concerned about the impact on, on tourism uh, than on whether or not we're an actual target. Thank you, Ralph. Yes, sir. Hi. Taeyong Ho, uh, former number two at uh, the London Embassy and the highest level uh, defector in North Korean history, was quoted, and I'll paraphrase, uh, by saying, 
we need to pour a gasoline on North Korea, and we need to have the North Korean people uh, light the fuse, to, some, to a certain degree like that. I was wondering what you make of that statement, and also, if that were to serve as a, as a basis to form a new policy option, what might that policy option look like? Uh, I've seen uh, various statements from, from Mr. Tay, uh, apparently a very intelligent uh, person, uh, but who chose to uh, cast his lot in, in, in the South uh, and uh, certainly must have uh, shaken the North Korea diplomatic corps that he did so. Uh, it's awfully risky to suggest that something is, uh, uh, you can just light a fuse or toss a match and something dramatic uh, will, will happen. And so uh, uh, there might be such a case, but uh, it's, it's unlikely. And I don't think uh, uh, the, the fear of having an inadvertent war in Korea again is uh, a very strong uh, focal point for reality in thinking about this. And it's uh, what's the essence of the alliance that the U.S. has with, with South Korea uh, and uh, needs to recognize uh, that this is the reality and that there are many uh, millions of, uh, of South Koreans and North Koreans uh, who have a stake in this. So uh, uh, who knows? He, he said it. Uh, but uh, most of the evidence uh, doesn't support that it's quite that that ready. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a it's a risky option. I mean, what what we've been trying to do with all the last four or five administrations, including uh, when Jim was in government, have been trying to do we would call regime transformation. We're trying to get the North Koreans to, you know, the famous quote was bring them to their senses, not to their knees. Uh, it would be wonderful if uh, we woke up tomorrow morning and, and there had been a coup in North Korea and they had removed Kim Jong-un and if there were things that we could do to help facilitate that, uh, the regime change option is something that people would look at and some people have promoted. The real problem in North Korea is that it, it's such an incredibly paranoid society uh, that no two people trust one another enough to sit and collude against the government uh, because mothers have turned in their own sons and vice versa. Uh, so it's very difficult to, uh, you can pour all the gasoline you want, uh, but it's going to take more than one guy lighting a match. And to get the two of them together and agree to light the match is going to be very, very difficult. So uh, I understand, you know, the logic behind let's, let's try to destabilize the North Korean government and then uh, create a chaos from within. Uh, but the reality is, you know, during in, in history, it shows you that starving people don't overthrow government. Starving people starve. Uh, and the overthrow is coming basically from the elite. And right now, the elite still see uh, being part of that, that ruling clique as essential to their survival. If that changes, if that could change, perhaps, perhaps it would change, and then that option would make more sense. Can I just add that research also shows uh, something called the J curve, which is that persistently poor peoples, uh, starving peoples, and, and even not quite starving peoples, uh, aren't the ones who bring about over, overthrows. It's societies that see a, a sudden increase in standard of living that creates rising expectations that the government can then cannot then uh, fulfill year after year. Those are the societies that are that are most likely to see a, a change of government. Hence the J, a sudden a sudden rise. So I'm all for not pouring gasoline on North Korea, but, but uh, encouraging all the contact with the outside world, uh, all the education, uh, all, the, all the sharing of uh, cultural events and so on that the North Koreans are willing to absorb, uh, smuggling in DVDs if that's what it takes. I, I'd love to see the South Koreans make South Korean dramas the way we make the Hawaii Five-0 show, right? <laughs> so that there are, there are these interesting scenes and... In, in, uh, tourist uh, 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 sort of hooks put in there, you know, broad sweeps of looks at Seoul and, and uh, 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 giving North Koreans a broader look at South Korean society and how wealthy it is and add those into the DVDs. Uh, but most importantly, 
Anything we can do to help uh, North Korea develop economically is an investment in the future of Korea. And it's, it, it will lighten the burden for South Koreans when that day does come, that they need to inherit this mess that the North Korean government has made uh, uh, through its mismanagement of, over the decades. We do have a little bit more time, two more questions. So you're the lucky one. Please. Hi, I'm Susan Kreifels from the East West Center. I work with media programs. And I'm wondering where do we get most of our information on North Korea? Where do we get our best and most credible information? We work with so many Korean journalists, and including North Korea defector media. So I would like to know from our experts, where is our best information coming, most credible information coming from on North Korea? Thank you. From the Pacific Forum, of course, is this, is, but, uh. I, I would say one important source is the kind of meetings that, that Ralph organizes and goes to, uh, usually track two, right, uh, where uh, thoughtful and policy-connected Americans can talk with their counterparts in North Korea. And, and I, I think a lot comes through that beyond the talking points, you know, when they, uh, when they, when they meet repeatedly and uh, they barriers begin to fall a little bit. I think those are great sources of information. But the second most important source, I think, is, is basically covert journalism. It's, it's uh, uh, people who have contacts in North Korea uh, who actually live in China or they travel for short periods into North Korea. Uh, those folks are heroes, and uh, we rely extremely heavily on, on uh, information that comes out from that form, and they go to great risks to bring us that information. Just to add just a, a little bit more on sources, uh, it's occasional visitors, it's anyone. Uh, with journalists, the North Koreans really work hard on isolating the uh, journalists who travel in. Uh, the visit of these really excellent New York Times people over the last couple of weeks is instructive. Uh, they had them uh, tagged to an envelope. Uh, they certainly didn't get to see anybody that the, the leadership didn't want them to see. And so uh, because of these restrictions on journalists uh, and the difficulty of getting uh, people in there, it's, uh, it's, it's broad. It means questioning all kinds of refugees, people who have come across the border into China. Uh, it, it's just uh, an incidental uh, sort, of a, sort of a reality. And we have to keep in mind this economic difference that Ralph touched on. Uh, Denny mentioned 30 times is the difference between the economies of North Korea and South. Germany is still having problems from its merger. And what was the German division? It was, I think, four to one, five to one. Uh, this, is, this is a very serious uh, uh, difficulty that's going to be faced someday, and we don't know when it is. Well, last question, the pressure. <laughs> um, the U.S., since shortly after World War II, has lost its monopoly on atomic power, nuclear power, I want to say as early as 1949. So with North Korea's narrative of self-defense, security, and survival of its regime, to what extent is, if, is the U.S. and even the world willing to accept the growing um, need or want in North Korea's nuclear capabilities? Because with their narratives of as in this regime survival, they don't want to give this up anytime soon. So how, how is the U.S. and even the world willing to accept, to what extent willing to accept North Korea having nuclear capabilities, even to the extent or comparison to Pakistan? Yeah. The Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, well, when was that, Ralph? Uh, 70s? 74 or so. Uh, tried to establish a, the terms of the existing nuclear powers, uh, five, uh, France, uh, England, U.S., Soviet Union, and China uh, as the, new, the powers that pledged sometime to seek the elimination of nuclear weapons 
and that has been called on recently. And everybody else, and there were some 190 signatories to the NPT, including at one time North Korea, uh, pledged that they would not develop nuclear weapons in that process. Uh, in a historical sense, it, this is really held up maybe better than cynics would have expected. Uh, there's been this erosion of Pakistan and India. Uh, Israel has uh, clearly been an acknowledged power. Uh, South Africa went that direction and then turned around. Uh, the removal of tactical nuclear weapons by the U.S. from worldwide uh, is seen by the, the North Koreans as a gesture to themselves back in 1992. It was really something that George H.W. Bush did at the end of the uh, Soviet Union to try to get all of the Soviet Union's nuclear weapons brought in from the former Soviet republics, including a, uh, a treaty that guaranteed the uh, uh, territory of the Ukraine, which has recently been left behind. Uh, uh, Ukraine gave up nuclear weapons uh, to, uh, to be a party to this thing. So uh, uh, it's a never-ending struggle to try to minimize the number of countries and institutions in the world that have the, the capability of, de of killing thousands, if not millions. When, when I was an international relations major in college in the 60s, uh, the prediction was that by the turn of the century, there'd be between 40 and 50 countries with nuclear weapons. Uh, because of the MPT, uh, we're still essentially counting on, on two hands and maybe an additional finger or two, uh, the number. So uh, there's been a great deal of success. So the, the question, I guess, to, to play your question back is define accept. Uh, in reality, we've accepted India and Pakistan as nuclear weapon states, but we don't acknowledge them officially as nuclear weapon states. We've accepted North Korea as a de facto nuclear weapon state because we haven't gone in and taken them away from them. But to, to officially accept them uh, would, in many cases, or most, most likely, undermine the NPT. You would then... Uh, you know, there's 70 to 75 percent of the people in South Korea believe they should have nuclear weapons. Uh, that could very well be the next domino to fall. If we were to accept North Korea, if we were to remove denuclearization as our long-term goal, uh, then that would have implications perhaps for the Japanese, perhaps for Taiwan, perhaps for others. So uh, you have to be very careful. It's one thing to learn to live with this capability and to defend against it and deter it. And we've been successful at deterring North Korea from using its military capabilities. It's another thing to, quote, accept them as a nuclear weapon state, acknowledge their nuclear capabilities, because that could create certain domino effect that would undermine what what the MPT has, has thus far been able to accomplish, which is actually quite remarkable considering what the predictions were back in the 60s. On that hopeful note, I'm going to turn it over to Ralph to conclude our forum. Uh, please take the mic. Right. Well, uh, again, let me thank, uh, first of all, uh, the four sponsors uh, and particularly Civil Beat for uh, bringing this beyond just this room to others who, uh, who chose to, to listen. Uh, most importantly, let me thank all of you for coming. Uh, and for the great questions uh, that uh, certainly have made us think and, and uh, push forward. Uh, I joked about use Pacific Forum as your reliable source, but we do produce uh, commentaries a couple of times a week, and there are some on the back table. Anyone that wants to be on our mailing list, please let us know, and we're happy to uh, add you to it. If you haven't had enough uh, on this subject, I'll be speaking at the Japan Society uh, next week. Uh, there's a flyer on your table, so come on out and we'll, we'll go through it again. Uh, but beyond that, just let me ask you to join me in thanking uh, our panelists for a very instructive evening. Thank you all.